Hello there, Ferdinand here with another interview from the FMX 2014. We will talk to independent filmmaker and professor Hannes Rall about finding a unique, perfect fitting style for your film. He also will give us an insight into his work as an independent animator. So, especially if you're looking for creating unique animations, you shouldn't miss this next talk. My talk at the FMX was actually about stylized character animation or how you can make a difference from I would say what is more like the common formula in character animation particularly for CG feature animation these days. And I was uh, talking about examples from animation history uh, from animated short films but also animated feature films there a more stylized approach to character animation uh, was applied and how this also is partially continued in today's CG animation. But the main point of my um, talk was basically um, stating that uh, there should be more courage for invention, innovation, and more stylistically diverse character animation in CG feature films. What would you say is the advantage of going more stylized or developing an own new style? Well, I think what, what animation is best at, in my point of view, is inventing movement. That's also what fascinates animators creating their own worlds with their own characters. So character design is also, I believe, closely tied with the way a character should move. And it's, of course, I believe most satisfying if an animator can really invent movement instead of trying to replicate movement as closely as possible to reality, which is, of course, also very often justified by the story content in certain feature films. However, on the other side, for the animator, it's not such a, um, it's not so much fun, to put it that way. And uh, to put it in a simple way, very often the fun, the inventiveness and uh, the craziness shows, you know, positively. A very good example from Animation history is Milt Carl, the famous Disney animator, who was such a brilliant draftsman that he was always assigned the, um, the lead characters who had to be more realistic. So he very often complained that he could never get so much to the fun part of animation, to the wacky sidekicks where he could get more inventive and playful in the animation. How do you approach your own projects if you have mm. to come up with the style for it? Well, I think always what is always very important is that the story should fit the style and vice versa. So that means that um, if you are working in a certain style or you're working in a certain style range, it's very difficult if you're not a perfectly versatile animator to adapt to a story which doesn't fit that style. The other way around, if you are dealing with a story, um, a good, very good example is gravity. If you think about gravity, there it was, of course, required that any animation had to fit in seamlessly with a hyper-realistic environment because at its very basis the idea was a live-action film, although that live-action film was achieved uh, to a large extent by using animation. But here the style of the animation had to be very realistic to fulfill the story requirements. On the other hand, if there is a film which is really um, intentionally wild, imaginative in its world creation, in its character design, let's say Hotel Transylvania or Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, then uh, the idea for the character animation can be very different because this is not about realism, this is about inventing movement and inventing very original movement will, which will match the, the character designs and the wackiness of a whole idea. What would you say are films that do that very successfully nowadays? Well, I think there is, uh, I just already mentioned The Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, Hotel Transylvania. Then also recently two films which come to, to mind is uh, from the Disney side, and it's a very nice comparison there. I thought Wreck-It Ralph was very interesting in terms of 
coming up with extremely inventive character animation, which again fit the story. And um, there is also uh, several other uh, newer examples, for example, the Lego movie, which I think is a perfect marriage between content and style. And they're intentionally a very restrained and limited uh, style of character animation is chosen to match the topic. So it's really animated as if you would be animating Lego in stop motion to a large extent. And I find that a great match, you know. It's not, I'm not saying that each and every movie has to be animated in a very stylized way, but if content and character design and animation fit together well in that respect, then it's artistically successful, I believe. What would you tell the people that think that this isn't true? I mean, especially if we think about German animation features, they always try to mimic Pixar, which they actually do quite well, but their films are not really, they don't flow as nicely, they don't fit together. Um, what would you tell people who think everything has to be Pixar and everything has to be Disney style? I, I think that the problem is very often, and I can already see the same thing probably happening now. We have this huge success with Frozen, as the you know biggest you know gross in feature animation of all times. Is that once there is a successful model, people believe they can replicate that success by copying a formula, but then. That has two crucial uh, failures. First of all, today's successes can be tomorrow's failures and vice versa. So very often uh, something which was not mainstream in the beginning, in the end turned out to be a big mainstream success. My favorite example is always Tim Burton. I mean, back in the 80s, he was actually basically let go by Disney because they told him, your stuff is really too out there to fit into the Disney mold. So it's not really working for us. And he became one of the most successful uh, directors of all times. And his type of style is um, now widely accepted. Now, when it comes to German production, and I think it's like a worldwide phenomenon. I mean, I can partially the same thing happening in Asia as well, that you look at Pixar, you look at Disney now in, in a way, you know, like also with CG, and then we say, oh, well, uh, we should do something like that. Um, but the problem is, if you try to do something like that, you easily can end up being just second best. And nobody wants to look at the second best, you know, and or something which is almost as good. So you should avoid the comparison and try to go your own way. And I'm not saying that there will be immediately, you know, a huge um, commercial success. But I think in the long run, what really can stand the test of time and then maybe also can create new trends would be just being, you know, original, being innovative, doing something else. And I know it's not easy because, of course, very often broadcasters, distributors, they trust most in the tried and tested. But I think there are ways or there are there should be more courage to try something different. Now, you have worked a lot independently. And could you maybe tell us a little bit more about how that works, how you get the means to do your own stuff? Uh, how right, does this right, path right. look like? Um, first of all, I think what is needed to do that is always the urge to do it. You know, I mean, you really have to be very passionate about uh, creating animation and continuing to create animation and being a practitioner while you're also teaching, which is sometimes really a little bit of a balancing job, but it also, one thing also feeds back nicely into the other. So what I learned in my independent, for my independent direction, you know, I can also bring back to my teaching and vice versa. So it's very interesting in that way. Um, what of course is very important and luckily we still have this very good support system here in Baden-Württemberg with the film funding that uh, there is some support for the creation of independent animated short films, because of course they are not as commercially attractive or exploitable as the big feature film projects. So, and the end of the day, they will probably not make big profits. However, I think they can really have this kind of beacon function artistically that you can try out a lot of different styles, a lot of different approaches, and 
thereby create trends and do something really different and really interesting. And it also allows you, because that the financial risk is somewhat how limited, it also allows you then uh, to do really what you like without compromising at all. And that is really fantastic here that if you get the film funding and you, of course, on the basis of an approved storyboard and so forth, but you're really left alone with your pro project to uh, express yourself creatively as you like it. So there's not that input uh, like with commercial distributors who would force you to compromise on grounds of uh, commercial reasons, which very often destroys uh, the purity of the artistic uh, expression. And that is really great. And that's what I love about the independent approach. What could you advise to somebody who uh, wants to go that direction, who wants to start making their own small independent movies? I think first of all, what, what is very important to, to look at is what is your situation in the country you are in. It's very different in a country like Germany or let's say France, where you have a very well uh, functioning support system for animated short films. It's also still not easy because first of all, you have to get your foot in the door. You have to convince the funding institutions. But I think that is possible if you really do good work and if you build um, some trust with the funding institution so that you deliver on your promise once you get the funding, you get your film into festivals, maybe win awards, and then it kind of like it continues. However, I think everybody has to be clear, even if you're in a country with a funding system, and even more so if you're in a country without any funding like the US or the UK, where there is some funding but very little, um, is that that will not support your life. So what I know and what, what the history of many of my colleagues is you have to look for additional sources of income. And that can be freelancing for commercial projects, having your own studio running, that, for example, like, like Studio Soidas, there, there is a combination of independent and, and commission production. So that, that is an approach which has worked now for many people for uh, quite some time. I mean, animation is quite young, even here in, in uh, in Germany or maybe particularly here, but that is a kind of role model which has established itself in the last 20 years, more or less, I would say. And it's not easy, but I think the artistic rewards, the personal rewards are really high if that happens. What is very important, and that is something which is uh, understandably neglected, but it should be very important or it's very helpful to know about it, is that it's really important to be, start building your career in terms of commission work during your studies. That makes it much, much easier. So basically what doesn't happen is that freelancing doesn't work, that you are leaving university, you have your showreel, and then the world is just waiting for you. What is one of the hardest things to do is the so-called, you know, like the cold calls, the acquisition. And um, in a very competitive world, and this world is more competitive than ever, with a whole global competition. That means that there's not like art directors sitting around and just waiting for the one student graduating and then giving jobs to that one student. So there's usually huge stacks of materials. They have to look through, they get a lot of emails, they have to see a lot of links and they don't have time. So what works better is if you look out constantly during your studies for some opportunity and usually such opportunity comes along. Maybe some of your senior uh, fellow students has already a job he, you can contribute to. You can get your feet wet in professional work. You have that already to show that that's the first step to build that confidence with clients and to understand the professional work conditions. And once you have done something professionally, it's much easier to gain more clients because The client will trust you much more if you have already done something in a professional production environment or for a professional client. So that is really important that because otherwise, if you're planning to go freelance, you will graduate and you will fall into this deep, deep black hole. And that can be very frustrating. And most of the people I know who have started successfully building a career is that um, you have Uh, a basic roster of clients you're already working with and you can build on that more and more. 
What would you say is important for the for the choice whether you want to become an independent animator or a Pixar animator? Mm. I think most important is who you are. So be true to yourself. So what I see sometimes with students is that they're trying to be somebody who they aren't. So because they think, okay, I need to make money. Understandable. Of course, you need to make a living with your art. But on the other hand, if you are not a natural or you're not strongly inclined in the way you animate, in the way you design and so forth towards commercial or mainstream uh, animation, then it's really not very recommended to try to be that person because you will be working all the time against who you really are. So I think, I personally do think, and then I, you know, like watch careers over a longer time. I think it's better, you know, if you're a really great avant-garde animator and you're doing crazy outlandish th things, it's better to, to stick to that and maybe get less financial rewards but be really outstanding in what you do. And I believe in the long run, there will be a way, you know, where you can find your footing also to make a living, I believe, you know. I mean, it's not always easy, but that's a better way if, as if trying to be somebody who you are not. And also, of course, um, if you're not very good at animating commercially or in a very commercial style, you will not get the jobs anyways. You are looking for to make the big money and you will just end up, um, let's say, frustrated trying to get there. So I know that very well because I was there myself when I was graduating. I was really thinking, oh, I'm freaking out. There was a, the beginning days of a film academy. And at that time, there was no film funding existing. It was the early 90s in, in Baden-Württemberg. The film funding came later, a few years later. Um, there was no possibility to work in a big studio here, actually. So it was really, it was really difficult. And my style was also not something which would fit in easily. But on the other hand, I was quite versatile. I could do different illustration and animation styles. And I could also branch out to comics, storyboards, things like that. So what it turned out to be was a, a wide mix of things. I could advertise, I could uh, offer to clients. And in that kind of mix, I managed to be um, quite successful as a freelancer and then in the longer run also combined that once the film funding came along with my independent animation films. And in the long run, I have to say that the independent animation films, they were really, really successful and helpful in a lot of ways, you know, to build your profile and to become known in the world. And I think nowadays, uh, it's even much easier to become known. It's maybe harder to make money like it used to be, but at least you can get your profile out there quite easily. How do you go about your, your own film production? How big is a team mm -hmm. usually? Um, does it have different phases? Is, does it yeah, have yeah. departments? Mm -hmm. Okay, it very much depends on the scale of a project. So what I started out with was always usually, it was actually my first um, three to five films I did between three and eight minutes. And then most of the stuff was really done by myself. I had some people helping for, and it was still uh, 2D analog, you know, like coloring on paper or then later on uh, coloring the digital uh, cells or coloring in the computer. Uh, the latest project I did that was The Cold Heart, which is like a almost 30 minute uh, film or basically it's a 30 minute film. Uh, that was very different because that for the first time had some kind of different narrative requirements and also due to the length had some very different production requirements. So it simply was too big to not approach it in kind of a more organized and more compartmentalized day that you really had you had different animators you were working with. There was a whole unit, actually a, a company there. In the end, the whole digital compositing and the coloring was outsourced too. And so it was very much, it was almost like a feature film, only that they didn't have uh, the, um, the big overhead of a feature film of a big studio to organize that in that way. But it pretty much 
was working that way. And it was also interesting because it was a production which was uh, conducted and kind of directed over several countries. So the major part was all done in Germany. So there were like a lot of animators here. For example, uh, somebody who is uh, with a studio film builder, um, um, Ralf Bode. And then there were like uh, my, my business partner and uh, fellow animator, Michael Meyer, who was doing a lot of stuff and some more animators here, but also animators in Asia. And um, so that was very interesting because it was a completely uh, virtually directed production there uh, you had a lot of things there, you know, I was looking at dailies, I was looking at animation coming back from the different animators and I was also of course then giving comments and one of the major tasks was really to keep the visual style uh, intact or cohesive because it was a very special style and it was very important that the film looked as uh, basically uh, intact in terms of uh, communicating that animation style, that design style, which is typical for my films. And that was a lot of a part of the work there. <laughs>